all know that our own Dave Miller is the manager of the St. Louis Air Regional Airport. We have all enjoyed his updates on what's going on with aviation in our community. Most of us are familiar with Dave's interest in music, especially as a clarinet player. But <coughs> Dave has an yet another alter ego. He is also a ham radio operator. Did you all know that? Dave was first licensed in 1959. He has operated his ham radio sets all across the United States, from Maine to California, from Florida to Alaska, and from Texas to North Dakota. Internationally, he has operated his station in Canada, Okinawa, Taiwan, Guam, the Philippines, Spain, and England. <clears throat> True to Dave's penance for community service, Dave serves the emergency coordinator for the amateur radio emergency service for Madison County. I'm getting kind of caught up here. Please welcome K0RJL as he shares his hobby and what he does for the community. Now we need thunderous applause. For <laughs> to turn on that air conditioner, I'd much rather have you be comfortable and pay attention to anything I have to say. So, you can go ahead and kick it on. I'm going to spend uh, just about two minutes explaining the world's best radio, and all of you brought that radio with you today because it's strictly in your imagination. It doesn't exist. But I will need some help as I explain the radio dial. I'm also going to take your pen here for a minute because mine broke. <laughs> Cheap pen I picked up at the this is the radio dial for this uh, super radio. Why don't you pick it up to about there? Rose, I have a place for you. And how many more do we need here? Yeah, one more ought to do it. Can you help me out here? Okay, this is the world's most uh, uh, best radio. And this represents the radio dial on that radio. Clear down on this end, right about in here, and you're all familiar with this, this is the AM radio dial. This is where you get KTRS and KMOX, that type of thing. You go lower than that, and uh, Mark Special has spent time down in there. That's where the uh, non-directional beacon, the NDB uh, radio frequencies are. You go uh, above the AM band, you get into one of the amateur bands called the 160 meter band, then there's the 80 and 75 meter band. You get up here, it's the 40 meter, uh, 30 meter. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then, of course, the ever popular 20 meter band. You all know that. Uh, 17 meters, 15 meters, 12 meters. Now, right here on the rotary dial is something you're all familiar with. The 11 meter band. Does that mean anything to anybody? No. That's the CB band. You know, Michael Riker, one nine, here's the dot over, you know, that, that type of thing. All that was on, uh, and, and it's still there. You don't need a license for that. Just buy the radio and say hello. Above that's a 10 meter band. Then you get into what they call the uh, VHF low band. And there's still some uh, highway control stuff in there, there's some military <coughs> stuff in there. Then you start the VHF high band. This is pretty interesting. Uh, down here is where all the secret frequencies are for the FBI and, uh, uh, and that type of stuff. Then you get into the amateur two meter band, then you get in police and fire, and uh, then you start getting up into UHF and beyond. As we go beyond, we eventually start getting up into microwaves, and then uh, somewhere down here, a VHF a low band is uh, TV channels 2 through 6, and then 7 through 13, <coughs> right here, uh, yeah, right about, right about where his nose is, and then uh, 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 microwave and all that stuff. So, there's a wide spectrum in this super radio. Thank you very much. You can, you can drop the dial there and throw it away or keep it. I'll sign it and photograph it.
When it comes to the amateur bands, the so-called high-frequency bands, that was the 160, the 80, 75 up through 10 meter band, comes out of this radio right here. It's uh, in the old days we used to call that shortwave radio. And with this radio it's sitting right here on the table, uh, within the last uh, two weeks, I've talked to um, uh, Natalie Holloway. Where would she kill Aruba? Uh, the thing that was special to me about it, it's not that big a deal to lob a signal that far away, but to get a signal that far away and find somebody actually there that will talk to you, that, that was really special. Also into um, uh, Portugal, uh, Brazil, and Russia. Uh, the other thing that I do with this radio down on the 75 meter band, uh, just about 6 o'clock every evening I check into a statewide uh, ham radio net on Tuesday nights, I'm the net control right out of either my basement at home or my office uh, out at the airport. And speaking of the airport, there is a handout here that talks about Lewis and Clark Radio Club Field Day. If you want a demonstration of amateur radio, it will be that weekend. It will be on the, the carport that's off the end of my office at the airport. It will start at noon on Saturday, go through noon on Sunday. Guess what happens Sunday night? Cornerstone Church fireworks. So. It's a, it's, it's a neat time to be at the airport. Um, okay, just a few uh, more words about the toys here. This little rig is a lot of fun. It works Morse code only. It works the 30 meter band only. I can get uh, just uh, C cell or uh, D cell radio batteries and, and run the thing off or work it off of a wall wart uh, type power supply. Had a lot of fun with that. I have actually talked to a Belgium it only puts out about five watts. Uh, and again, use Morse code. There's some Morse code keys there. Now, the, the bulk of my presentation is what does all this mean to you? There is something that happens on that two meter band, and that's with this radio here. Unless somebody stepped on my plug. No, there it is, by golly. Amateur radio operators cooperate with the National Weather Service for severe storm spotting. Now you're at home minding your own business, the siren goes off. What happened? I mean somebody had to push the button to make that siren go off, but somebody had to tell the person that pushes the button to make the siren go off what are some of the decision making processes that went on to get to that point. The National Weather Service has Doppler radar. They can see when severe weather is coming. The other thing here in Illinois, we don't necessarily need radar to tell us that uh, bad weather is coming. Wake up, wake up in the morning, the humidity is, is heavy, it's oppressive, uh, thunderstorms start, uh, thunder clouds start building up, you know something is going to happen. But the National Weather Service, with their Doppler radar, they can track those clouds and they start to see that infamous little hook shaped echo. But they can, nobody wants to turn on the air conditioning? All you guys are comfortable but me? Okay. Maybe I'm going through change of life. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> but uh, before they can tell somebody to push that button, they have to have visual sight. They have to have visual confirmation that that bad weather is really out there. So for the last 20, 25 years, this program has been going on. I originally had my Skywarn training from the National Weather Service when I was in Minot, North Dakota. North Dakota is a lot different than Illinois when it comes to severe weather spotting simply because there are not too many people per square inch in North Dakota. There are vast areas, sparsely populated uh, uh, areas, so there, there's not an abundance of people out there to say, hey, yeah, I see a wall cloud, yeah, I see it starting to rotate, yeah, I'm starting to see a funnel. Nobody out there to see that stuff. So here comes a storm barreling towards Bismarck or Minot, and nobody knows anything about it. In that case, is what we would do as ham radio operators. We would um, collect with our, our, our mobile units, very similar to that one. 